everybody can see my 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 screen with the with the questions over on the left. All right. So so a couple of review questions while we while while we wait for people to join in. Okay. Okay. The string howls moving castles about string. Why isn't that a problem? A single the single quote in the word howls isn't escaped. So if we go over here and take a look, right? The thing is is that when you've got uh you can use either single quotes or double quotes in Python. So this is cool. Isn't it right? That's a valid string. No, no need to escape any characters because we said the quote, the string opens with a single quote. On the other hand, if I, sorry, but the double quote, on the other hand, if we opened it with a single quote, we'd have some great issues over here when we did this, right? That would end that. On the other hand, you could use, uh, you can use single quotes to do things like this. He said, hi, like that. And that's pretty, and that's great. All right. If L is a list, right? L is equal to list. If L is equal to list uh, range five, right? L's, like you can do that, by the way. If L's a list like that, then, um, oh, you, oh, then we can do L. One second, laser. This to reverse it. Very useful tool there. All right. You can come over, laser. All right. All right. This is laser. This is my kid. And he's going as oh, here, here. <laughs> he's going as Harry Potter this uh this year. And so he he makes all he makes all the costuming decisions as to what we're going to do each year. Uh I I'm dressed up as Dumbledore. So, and my wife is going to be Minerva McGonagall. So, there you go. He's being shy now. Oh, no, no, he's not. He's doing fine. He's like yeah. Like yep. So, yeah. Stop <laughs> that. What are you doing? <laughs> you're playing with your, you're playing with the little knobbly bit that, that's off of this. Yeah. That's actually good. The, the novelty bit, yeah. All right, so uh, so obviously the re you know, it's a pretty good thing that we, that I stayed home because this means I get to maximize trick or treating. You see, that's the key. When you have kids, suddenly you can trick or treat again. All right, so I'm gonna get back to te teaching. Thanks for thanks for showing up, Laser. Stay in my row. You're more than welcome to. All right, share. My entire screen again. There we go. Okay, hopefully that should be back to normal. All right, so we have, if L's a list, what does the expression L colon colon negative one do? That reverses a list. This is very useful to know. It's not like you're not gonna fail if you don't know it. You're not gonna get anything wrong if you don't know it. It's just really useful to know because it's it it, it speeds up your time um, in a lot of things. How can you, how can use, how can use, very good. How can you slice notation to get the last three characters of the string? Um, this is a long string, right? If I want to get ing, right? If I want to do that, all I have to do is s is equal to, this is a long string, s negative, negative three, sorry, s begin at negative three, it said begin at negative three to the end. In, right? How do you simulate a coin flip in Python? We're going to do, you use random to do that, import random. And then there's a bunch of different ways you could do that. You could do uh, random dot choice, you know, uh, head, tail. You could do that. That's that's the way I've been doing it. Oops. Or you could do random dot rand int one 
to two. Random is the only thing in programming. It is the only thing in programming where it, I feel that basically it's not up, it's not up to but not including. It's both things. So this would be you could say one is is a is a heads, two is a tail. Doesn't really matter. Okay. And then if I have a coin flip weighted slightly in heads, then what do I need to do? Two ways to do that, right? I could make my uh, sides of a coin be like this. Um, H time, I could make it H times 55 plus T times 45. And suddenly sides is now, whoops, sides is this thing over here right? Which will have 55 heads, 45 tails. So it's weighted slightly in favor of heads. And if I do that, then it's, if I do random not choice on that, that's fine. That's great. It's going to work just fine. All right. Random not choice. Sides. Laser, can you lower that please? Okay. So we got, so, so that will be slightly weighted in, in the favor of heads. Other thing you could do is just use numbers. All right, so let's get into the meat of this. The one, the parts that we where that are actually going to be useful for the exam. The exam will have a a file reading question. It will almost certainly be worth twenty points. All right. Um, suppose we have a file called temperature.csv, which has the daily high and low temperatures in Philadelphia. It's composed of three fields per line containing the data, the high temperature and the low da uh, temperature. Okay, each field is separated by comma. It might look like this, right? And that's just simply formatted nice. So not there might be spaces, there might not. It doesn't really matter. Uh, Python doesn't really care about that too much. Write a program that calculates or prints the following. The day with the high, hottest high, the day with the lowest, coldest low, and the average high temperature of the entire file. So let's go ahead and write this as a function. Def uh, temp read. Okay, and there's different ways we can do this. Uh, we know that the file is going to be called uh, temperature.csv, so you could hard code that in. Um, but if you do something like this instead, right? So if so, you could do it like this. Um, we could do, do something like this. Data is equal to um, open. You, and you don't necessarily need to do it as a function. I just am doing it as a function because I can. And because it's I, I'm going to have a lot of questions and I need to keep them organized. Uh, temper... Temp temperature.csv csv comma r but if you decided to do this as an argument and just put in file name over like put in file name if you decided to do this instead ah and then you did this either of these work i'm just going to do it like this because i think it's I, I like doing it that way more. Yes, the lecture will be posted. I also have to upload the previous lecture. Oh, and now that everybody is here, okay, or 97 of you, which is a very low number in my opinion of, of that, but now that you are here, let me be perfectly clear, okay? Um, the exam dates, okay, are as follows. The exam, here all, the exam starts the exam period starts on November 5th. So if you have a Monday lab, your exam is going to be November 11th. Okay, the exam is not on November 4th. The exam starts November 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, and then 11th, depending on when your lab is, okay? Because those Monday labs are a uh, lag a bit. I actually have to, after Halloween, after I'm done trick-or-treating, I'm going to be no, tomorrow I'm going to write the out uh, the uh, finish making my modifications to the exam and then send it out. Okay, so we have temperature. That we, so we have our file name. Now we're going to read from it. Okay. So, or we I mm, yeah we can do it just as a um, let's just go ahead and start reading four line in data. Right? Is this the appropriate way to do this? Don't know yet. That's okay though. But if I'm writing on a paper, I'm going to leave some space over here because I'm going to need to, I know I'm going to need to calculate some things here. So four line in data. data. So let's go ahead and we need to find the hottest high temperature. 
Okay, so let's go ahead and do fields is is equal to line dot split. Okay. Lines dot split over here to split the lines. Hottest is equal to lowest, sorry, coldest. And then we're going to need the average at some point. And then what we're going to do is, could, could you, hold on a second. All right. So let's see. Four line in data fields lined up split. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Great. Okay. Four lines that split. Let's go ahead and we've got. Our, so what we need is the. So we've got the date. We've got the high temperature and we've got the low temperature. The high temperature is simply the second field in there. So we are going to do high is equal to int int line. Sorry, fields one. And then the low for the day is equal to int fields two. Right now I'm just obviously doing the 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 high and the low at the same time. And so what we need to do is that we need to do basically we we basically are just reading each line, seeing A hey, is the hot hottest hotter than the than what we've seen before if the high temperature is greater than the hottest then high is equal to then uh hottest is equal to high and then if cold is less than lowest sorry not cold low is is less than the coldest coldest is equal to that low. Now, mind you, what does the program say it wants, though? It says we want the day with the hottest high and the day with the coldest low. So we're going to add some more fields. Hot day. And that's going to be really quick to do. Hot day is equal to some is equal to empty. Cold it and cold day is equal to Okay, so basically if the high, high for that day is hotter than anything else, we say, hey, fields zero, that's got the date in it, that's the hot day. And then the cold day is equal to fields zero. There we go. So that's pretty good. There is just one kind of minor issue that you may not think of here, which is that a uh, hot temperature, which is about these, it's more about the low temperatures than the hot, hottest. Notice that, the, that I basically just chose the default value of zero over here. This value hottest, sorry, of the coldest temperature, that's going to be greater than zero. And then I might erroneously get zero while I'm reading this file. So what we want to do is, funnily enough, I'm going to say that the coldest temperature is something really hot. So that it's always going to be slow, that so that we're always going to have a something that's slower, and that the hottest day is going to be something uh, really cold, right? Really cold, so that the hot first hottest day I find is going to be colder than that. Okay, then for the average, that's just simply the total, right? Is equal to zero, and we just need to add the entire hot. The what we need to do is we need two things. Right. And average, we can let's go ahead and move that to the end. We don't need that here. The average is equal to the total of the hot temperatures because we're calculating the average high temperature. So the average high 
divided by the number of days there were. So let's go with count rather than trying to be clever. And so we're going to say total and count is equal to zero. So when we read a line, and we could just tack this on at the end, uh, total plus equals the high temperature and the count, the number of things, lines we've read so far is equal to one. And that's how you would do this problem. This problem is very similar. You open up the file, okay? And then for this second one, I'm just gonna briefly mention it in the comments here because I wanna make sure I have time to hit everything. But what you would do is you'd simply do your line dot split on that one, right? On the commas. Fields is equal to line dot split on your commas. And then as you're splitting it, what you have to do, you basically say for, this would have a second for loop inside your for loop where you're reading the data. For num in fields, right? For each number, if num is even, which you do, yeah, so which would be num divided by two equals zero, right? Then you would add that to the total. Um, mind you, what we would need to do before that is int, because it's a string, we would have to do like num is equal to int num. But if you forgot that on the test, oh well. That would just, that'd be a very minor mistake. Okay, next problem. All right, method writing. I like this one because I can just simply drag these over here for it to, for us to read. Um, and there's those uh, weird quote marks as I was, as I was mentioning. So un or un, given a string, if a string begins with un, return a string without the un. Otherwise return a string with un added to the front. So untied becomes tied. Unable becomes able. Necessary becomes unnecessary. Will we lose, will you lose points? Um, oh yes, some questions here. Will you be allowed a cheat sheet like the last exam? Yes, you are allowed a cheat sheet just like you are the last exam. Um, next, do you lose points if you don't close the file? No, don't care. That's fine. Okay. Oh, well, that's that's the polite thing to do, but honestly, it's it's just such a pedantic thing to to worry about points for. Okay. Okay. On or on. So if the word begins with on, so I need to know if the word begins with on or does it begin with something else? And the easiest way to do that is, oh, and I you, I say you can assume the characters three, it's that the word is three characters long, but we don't need that even in Python. If word, if the, how do I check the first two letters of word? If beginning to index two, that's the first two letters, equal equals un, right? If it begins with un, we need to do something else, do something else. Technically what we're doing is returning. So I can just simply uh, uh, write down return, right? So if the word begins with un, I need it without the first two characters, without the un, which is the first two characters. So I would return word, but minus the first two characters. So I'd begin from character three, no, character two, right? This goes up to, but does not include index two. So this would include index two, but not anything else. Go to the end, boom, we're done. There, return word, and that's that. Now, if the word does not have un, we wanna add un to it. So we would just simply do un and concatenate with word. Very straightforward kind of thing. You just gotta think about it. A lot of these answers are a lot simpler. Some of them on the exam are not simpler, but um, this one's five points. So generally not too bad. This one exact like this one, the min max diff, that's five points. It's also a fairly straightforward one, right? Remember, the points correspond to the difficulty of the problem, okay? So given a list of integers, return the difference between the maximum, minimum element and the maximum, el sorry, minimum element and the maximum element, or max minus min, okay? So here we've got five, we've got four, because we've got five is the biggest, minus one is the smallest, here, we've got to do some math. Ugh, why did I make myself do math? 31 minus, six, minus 15, awesome, that is 16, right? The biggest minus the smallest. Here, this one's just 
reminded you ne how negative numbers work because it's always an easy mistake even I make these days. 100 minus negative 100, right? When you minus a negative, that's a positive. So that's why we get 200 there, okay? Biggest minus the smallest. Also, it shows goes to show that I'm not talking about magnitude. I'm actually saying biggest is a positive. You know, if the smallest number is a negative number, it's a smallest number. Doesn't matter that it's a negative number or not. So now, if you remember your keywords in Python, this is actually a one-line solution, which is max numbers minus min numbers. And you might be asking, really, does that, but I, can I do that on the exam? And, I'm, and again, my answer is, if it is valid in Python, you can do it on the exam, okay? If it's valid, you can do it. But what if you don't remember that, okay? What if you don't remember that because it's an, and it's an exam and despite my instructions that I put on every exam to not panic, I get students who panic every single time. I don't get it. I, I just don't. Anyway, no, exams are highly stressful situations so you know, might not remember. So in which case, what do we do? In that case, um, I'm gonna use biggest is equal to numbers. Sorry, I've got to find out what the biggest is. And, when I, and I'm going to assume that the biggest thing is the first thing, just to make it simple for me. And similarly, I'm going to say the smallest is equal to the first thing as well, because we need a default value. And I'm just going to assume that the, that the first item is both the biggest and the smallest. doesn't really matter if it's either. And then we do what we did in the, um, in the temperature one, which is for n in numbers, if n is less than, if n is greater than the biggest, right? If this is bigger than the biggest thing, then biggest becomes that value, okay? And then similarly, if n is less than the smallest, smallest becomes that, it, that is the new smallest value. It doesn't need to be an if else in this case. And then we just simply would do return, right? Return. Um, biggest minus smallest. Now, one thing I don't want to see on the exam for any of your questions, by the way, one thing I will get very annoyed with if I, on your exams, is if I see this. If you do this on the exam, I'm going to I don't know. It just makes me very upset when I see this because this shows me you don't understand how this works. This shows me you don't understand that the function takes in the value. And what you need to do is that you need to, sorry, this, and you need to use that. If you do this, I'm going to pass you a word and then you're just basically going to override it with some other thing, which is so, so don't do that. That shows me that you don't really know what's going on here. You shouldn't need to use the input at all during the ex entire exam, okay? The input is only there in the beginning because it's necessary for starting and doing interaction and stuff. Um, all right, swap ends is extra practice. That one is, um, is I'm just gonna quickly go over it because it's zero points. We are going to, yes, no input during the test. Right, let's go ahead and annotate, clear all the annotations. There we go. So we do that and swap ends. So uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a temp value. Whenever you do a swap, you need a temp. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna store the very last number in there. To swap ends, what I'm doing is I'm just swapping the values from the beginning at the end, right? If you couldn't see that over there, let's go ahead Oh, come on, copy paste. Okay, right, one and five swap places, 15 and 28 swap places, and that's it. Okay, so over here, what do we do for that? We say swap ends, we store the last number because in order to swap things, we have to temporarily overwrite them. Yes, we would, you can use the min max. Yeah, you can do this during the last question. That's what I said. I was just showing what if you forgot it. Numbers. Negative one, we're going to say, okay, we're going to, we're going to duplicate the first thing and put it in the very last index. We're going to take the, this value and store it in here, but that's okay 
So, so in this case, we would basically be taking one and five and we'd be ending up with one and one right now, but that's okay because temp, because temp is over here, temp is over here holding, is, is currently holding five. So we remember it. So then we need to just simply do this. Numbers zero is equal to temp. Also, if you really want to be cautious or not think have to think too hard about it, you can make two of them. You can make two variables, one for the like old first, old last, and then do it like that. Okay. Given a list of things. So sorry, first half. Let's go ahead and get this one. First half. If I'm going fast, it's because I want to make sure I'm going through everything. Okay. Okay. First half, given a list of things, return the first half of the list. And again, these quote marks are weird. They should look like this, but that's because that's the way strings uh, sometimes render when you grab them from a PDF. So don't worry about it too much. Okay, so we want to grab this first half of the list. We want to grab this first half of the list. And then if we've got eight items, we want to grab the first four. If we've got six items, we want to grab the first three. And then for this one, it says you want to grab the first two if there's an odd number of items. Now, the question is, do I have to worry about that really too much, an odd number of items? And the answer is, let's code and figure it out, okay? Because generally, well, it's a five-point problem, so probably not something to worry about. If we So let's go ahead and code this and see what I mean. Okay, to, so how do we solve this problem? How do we get the first half of the list? Well, to get the any portion of any sequence, we use a slice. That's all we do. We always use a slice. So that's what we're going to do here. We are just simply going to slice this list up. Okay. Um, so we just need a slice of the first half. So this is just a one-liner then. It's just a matter of figuring out, well, one or two. It's it it, it could be a one-liner. I'm just going to say we return the list. We're going to start at index zero, which we could just leave empty. And then we go up to the halfway point. So, or to the midpoint, let's call it midpoint, midpoint. Okay. So let's go ahead and see this. So if I want to do this, let's see. If I want to do this, I want to go, let's, let's look at this one since I don't have numbers in this one. There's eight here. The index is our zero through seven. If I want to get this, I want to go up to, but not include zero, one, two, three. So I want to go up to, but not include four, right? Well, the math easy is there. Four is half of the length here. So the midpoint is, so let's go ahead and just, I'm going to simply split this up and make it two lines rather than doing one. Midpoint is equal to the length of, the list divided by two. Divide, divide two there because we need that as an index. But if you, I take off at most one point or half a point if you forgot that. It's not a minor thing. Sorry, it's a minor thing, not a big deal. So one, two, three. So this is six long. Index zero, one, two, index three over here. So up to, but not including index three would give me this slice. Then, okay, what about five? This is five long. Five divided, divide two. What's five divided, divide two? Five integer, five divided by two is 2.5. So five double divide two just cuts off that point, uh, five. So we get, so we would get two. Zero up to, but not including index two. Index two is 21 over here. So this, so that's it. We don't have to worry about the half about. So that's the reason why I put that there to show you, because you, that way you don't have to worry about doing any additions or whatnot for odd numbers. Great. So that's how you get the source of the list. So you just have to think about these for some of these. Okay. This one's one of my favorite ones. Um, this one is, has, um, is an old exam problem. I moved it to a practice exam problem because too many people were getting seven out of 10 points on it. So I realized it was an unfair problem because for the most part, people do it right. Everybody understands it, but it still crashes for the most part uh, for most students on some, on some test cases on it. But even worse, I didn't, this was before I was, in, and 
people it would crash on people with test cases before I gave them a test case. And I didn't have and I and I mean and I don't list what what uh, where it might uh none of these will crash. But um this if you did this answer, you might want to try it on this one. Which is um taco. Okay. Taco, that should crash, actually. That would crash for a lot of students. Um, oh, it should be false there. And we'll go into why. Okay. So let's go ahead and write this like anybody, like anybody reasonable will would. Okay. So for this one, I can't just straight up iterate through this like I normally do. I can't go each letter by letter because what I have to do is I have to look two letters ahead, right? What I have to do is I have to say, if my current letter is C, I want to see if the one, two ahead of me is a T, right? So I can't just simply do four. I just can't do a normal for loop, four letter in word. I can't do that because I care about the index. So I have to keep track of the index. Now there's two ways I can do that. Four letter, sorry, not four letter, but four index in range len word. This is the classic way to do this, right? To get your indexes, okay? And we, then we would say letter is equal to um, letter is equal to uh, word. And yeah, let's just do it like this. Word. Index. I was lost in thought for a second about what to do. Because the other way to do this, by the way, is rather than doing it like this, is if you know your Python and read ahead, or index comma letter in range, sorry, not in range, but enumerate. See, it blows up purple like a keyword. Four letter in range, in enumerate word. Mm -hmm. Mistake on first half. Oh, yeah, yeah. There is a mistake there. Thank you. It's what happens when you talk and, and and at the same time. Thank you. Good call on that one. Okay, for letter, for index letter and enumerate word. Okay. You can do it like that as well. And that's the equivalent of doing the, of what we have above there. So let's go ahead and do this for word in range. That's not what I wanted to do. I accidentally mashed the wrong keys. If letter equal equals C, what in the world? If the letter is equal to C, okay, then in which case we want to check the letter to uh to above it. Sorry, two to the right of it. And word index plus two equal equals a T return true. Now, a very common mistake I see here, by the way, is this. But if you do this, what it's going to say is that it's only going to look at the first letter. So it's going to return false for kitty because, and true for catnip, but it's going to return false for tomcat because it's only going to look at the first letter. What you're saying is, okay, for every index, look get, get the letter at that index. If letter is C and the one and index th and index two happens to be a T, return true. Otherwise, return false. Which will immediately stop the pro which will immediately stop the function. So instead, what you need is this. And the way to remind this, to remember this, is that for true thing, 
for things that do true and false, the first thing you shouldn't do is write the for loop or anything like this. This would be the first thing you do. Figure out, are you assuming that a word has the tomcat, sorry, has the wildcat or does not have it? Assume false, then try to prove it true. As soon as we can see uh, that it's true, it's great. So this, for the most part, will actually work, um, which is as follows. If we try it out on, um, so let me move this over here. We do this as wildcat, kitty, expected colon. Where did I put, ah. So there, um, let's go ahead and print. Print has wildcat. So on the far on the far right, you should be seeing the output now. False does not have it. Tomcat. True. Catnip. Whoops. Catnip has it. And then if we look for taco. we get an index out of bounds exception, which is not what we're looking for, obviously. Um, now the reason this occurred, so this is why, why I say that most people get, got, we're getting seven out of 10 on the exam, okay? And it's because of this edge case over here, which is you always need to be careful when you're looking ahead that you don't accidentally look ahead out of bounds. Now, the reason it didn't show up over here is because of a feature called short circuiting. It never checks this part of the AND if it knows the first part is false. If the first part is false, well, with an AND, if one, if one thing is false, the whole thing is false, so we don't have to look at it. So it never gets to over to here to this T and tries to look two ahead. It only tries to look two ahead if there's a C. So over here, we had T, A, C. Let's look two ahead. Uh-oh. That doesn't work because that goes out of bounds. So how do we fix that? So the program agnostic, the programming language agnostic way to solve this, okay? Doesn't, we don't care which programming language you're using. The way we do this is we say, okay, I wanna go from, I'm just gonna simply put the zero over there because go from zero up to, but not including the length of the word. Well, this gets all of, this goes through all of the indices. So, um, if there isn't a C by the, by the third to the last letter, right, then there makes no point to try over here because it's in that, because there's no way that this can, a two letter uh, string can be cat. So we can do this. So we can say minus two over here because we're looking two ahead. So we do minus two to make sure we don't go out of bounds. That's the programming a language agnostic way to do that. Whenever you have to look ahead, make sure you uh, cut down that range by a corresponding amount. The Pythonic way, a Python way to do it though, a Python featured way to do that is we could do something totally different, of course. We could do, um, we could do something like this. We could do, we could, we could basically say, okay, let's do a slice and the slice doesn't go out of bounds. Uh, and slicing never goes out of bounds, so you don't have to worry. Don't worry about that. But actually, I want to make sure I have have chance to do this. So, okay, let's go ahead and go on to to. Um, I'll see about is everywhere later, but you can try that out on coding bat yourself. This one I thought was a good enough one to say on a test. Ten point one. Okay. So given a string, return of the sum of the digits zero through nine that appear in the string, ignoring all other characters. Return zero if there are no digits in the string. String dot is digit tests if S is one of the characters. So here we, this one is AA one BC two D three. It's, cited. Um, it would return, it will return true if it's, if, if the word is cited for the previous one. Okay. This one is one, two, 
three, six. One, one, B, 33 will be eight because one plus one plus three plus three is eight. Chocolate has no numbers in it, so we're going to get zero. So the, the, the tricky part of the, the, the pitfall here for beginners is you can't just do this. For, okay, I'm going to create my running sum, right? This is a running sum problem. We're adding stuff up uh, character by character. So total, return total, put that at the bottom. And what we would really love to do is something like this for total, sorry, for um, letter in word. Total is equal to total plus int letter. The issue is if, if that, if the letter is actually a letter and not a number, if it's not a number, it's going to crash, right? If I try to turn, if I go over here to the output, int, if I try to turn int um, a into a number, it's just going to tell me you can't convert a into a number. It's going to crash. So what we have to do first is, all we have to do here is check somehow if this is a number. And that's fairly straightforward. We just add an if statement. If and I give you the, and the answer is given to you right there. If letter it dot is digit, which will return true or false. Um, except that I got to actually spell correctly, which is lowercase, right? So boom, boom, boom. And now this part over here, print, and that gives me six. The key there is that it's only, it's going to skip over that. Now, what if I didn't tell you? Oh boy, what if I don't didn't tell you about all oh, dot is digit, and you're like P Professor Rose, and I, I don't, I uh, you know there is no magical function to do this. And then the answer is we just write it ourselves. We use the in function. Letter, if letter in, and we could do it like this, zero, one, two, three, four, five. We could do it like that. Well, it would be zero if letter in And if you did this on an exam, by the way, on paper, on a paper exam, this is perfectly acceptable, by the way. Make sense? That's perfectly fine on a paper exam. I get it. No worries. Don't, don't stress about it. Okay. More of the flexibility. Um, the quicker way to do it would be this, to do it like this, though, as one big string. Now, I don't really care. Uh, I'm not going to be too strict about uppercase and lowercase when it's on paper. That's something that's way easier to catch on. That's one of those. I care more about, do you understand the problem solving process, not the uh, necessarily the linguistic stuff. Okay. Also because some people, they find, they write in caps because they find their, that's, that's the way they like to write. And that's just not, that's cool. Whatever. Anyway, this will work just as well. Okay. All right. Next one is sum of digits. Okay. Sum of digits. Boom, boom. Okay. So given an integer, return the digit, uh, the sum of the digits for that integer. Pitfall over here uh, often is this. Total plus equals digit, turn total. And so we write this, but the issue is, of course, you can't iterate over and over and integer. These are integers, not strings. Given an integer, given an int, doesn't work that way. So in this case, what we have to do is um, one of two things. One is the, again, either of these work on a test, but in 
real life will want to do it the second way. The first way is, oh, I can't iterate over a number like a string. So I'm just going to turn that number into a string. Uh, this is technically very inefficient because you have to do multiple conversions. We turn that number into a string for digit in the number. We know everything is going to be, because we are converting this from an integer, we know for a fact that every single letter in the word is a is is fine to convert. So we just simply do this. There we go. And that is 10 points. Okay. Other way to do it though, is to do it the appropriate way and not convert. That's what I consider the appropriate way. But again, on an exam, you do what you can to show that you understand the problem and solve it. I'm not testing you on efficiency. I'm testing you on, can you problem solve? Do you, want, do you, do you have a mastery enough of this language? Okay. So what we do here is while number is greater than zero. While the number is bigger than zero, what we're going to do is we've got our total, just like we did last time. And we're going to return our total just like we did last time. So while the number is greater than zero, what we're going to do is we're going to use modular arithmetic. We're going to say digit is equal to, so we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to get the last digit. Digit is equal to digit, sorry, is equal to number, mod 10 to get the last digit. Total plus equals that digit. So we got to get the last digit. Now that we've gotten it, we need to throw away that digit. Num is equal to num divide divide 10. So get the last digit, add it, throw it away. That stops when we get to zero because eventually we're going to toss out a number, that last number, and that we're going to do a single digit number divide by 10, and then we'll get to zero. Extra practice. That's fine. All right, let's get into the Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo question. So um, just to give you, just to remind you, um, the Monte Carlo question that is going to be, on, that was on the exam and now I'm going to replace was the problem I did when I introduced Monte, Car Mo Monte Carlo approximations, which is uh, if I've got five, you know, which is what are the odds of getting five heads and five tails? If you flip 10 coins, what's the odds that five are heads and five are tails, right? So that was the question. That's a, that's a much simpler question than what I actually went over in, in class, which is, which was I wanted the full statistics. No, I just cared about like the win-loss ratio on that one. So that should give you a sense of the difficulty, which is um, I'm just going to ask you, what's the percentage chance of winning? Not like what's the full breakdown? The um, so, although I, I told this to my wife that I accidentally spoiled that question, and she's like, "You know what? You should just leave it in the exam to see how many students were paying attention." Um, but I do want to actually give you a te test that skill, not necessarily test whether you were paying attention in class. Sorry. So, um, this is one from a prior exam that was actually much trickier, I think. Okay. So I introduced this in class. In the board game Monopoly, players move around the board by rolling a pair of six-sided dice, right? Six-sided dice. Certainly, I have one lying around in here somewhere. Where are all my dice? Oh, no, there they are. They are on my desk, not in my desk, on my desk, right? Right, six side, six sided dice, six sided dice, cube, not twenty sided dice, right? Six sided dice. So we roll two six sided dice. Okay. Players move around the board by rolling a six sided dice, rolling doubles, which means that the two dice land on the same heads. That's are on the same on the same side, such as two threes getting a six or two fives. Okay, two threes or two fives. That's great. It allows you to roll again. It's not a matter of just getting a six, by the way. You, you don't get it for, for three and, you know, and for, th for two and four. You get it for two threes. 
Yeah, they got a match. It allows you to roll again, which is like going uh, another turn. So if the player rolls another set of du doubles, it allows them to go a third time. But if you roll doubles a third time, so if you roll three doubles in a row, uh, you go to jail for speeding. It ends your turn and you're trapped in jail until you can roll a double. So write 100,000 Monopoly, a program that simulates 100,000 Monopoly turns. Extra rolls we do due to doubles count as the same turn, where a turn is a single roll of the dice or more if the user rolls a double. Your program should print out the percentage of rolls without a double, one double, two doubles, and three doubles. Okay, so this one has a lot of different ways we can store that data. We could store it as, you know, a, we can store it as this as like a dictionary. We could store it as a list. We could store it as individual variables. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead and just store it as individual variables to keep it as as their trials is equal to 100,000. We need 100,000 of those. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do dubs. One, you know, one. Dubs one is equal to zero. Let's call it dub one for double one. Dub two is equal to zero. How many times we rolled two and dub three. How many times we got three doubles? Got it? So first thing we need to do is actually have dice to roll. So we need to do that. So we got to import random. Import random. Def. Roll. So... And that's going to, so to do a dice roll, we just need to return, we could do something like, uh, you know, if you, so you could do random dot choice. Do one, two, three, sorry, a sequence, which would be one, two, three, four, five. Um, another thing though you could do is you could just simply use randint. So that works. So just doing this, rand int one through six. Got it? Okay. Def turn, because that's what we're simulating. We're simulating a single turn. So in this turn, what do we need to do? We need to roll a dice. So uh, die, so D1, dice one is equal to roll. We get our dice. D2 is equal to roll. Okay, and we do it like that because we want to store those results. Okay, um, so what we're gonna do, or we could just, or we could just throw it into an if statement. But regardless, what we want to do is basically what we're asking is we want to say how many um could do it. We don't. Do we need dub zeros? Yeah, let's. That'll make it easier. Number of turns without a. Without without a zero without a um, roll. So if D one is not equal to D two, if they don't match, great. Dub zero plus equals plus equals one. The number of time, right? That's it. Makes sense. If they don't match, great. Turns over. Else, oh. Otherwise, if they don't match, the only possible th outcome it could be is that they match. So no elif, just else. Otherwise, they match. In which case, we need to roll them again. Okay? In which case, we roll these suckers again and see if they match. If, and then we ask the same question, which is kind of silly. This one, this is why I, I took this one off because I, while I like the logic of it, it kind of gets silly. If D1 is not equal to D2, if they're not equal again, uh, then we rolled one double, right? If we, it's here we got no doubles because they didn't match. Here, they matched once. 
and then we didn't match them again. So it says dub one plus equals one. Okay. Otherwise, guess what? We just rolled two in a row. We just rolled two doubles in a row. So then we got to roll it a third time. Okay. And then we ask again, if D1 not equal to D2, if they're, if we rolled it once and they matched, rolled it again and they matched, but rolled a third time and they don't match, awesome. Dub two plus equals one. Otherwise, we got three to match and that's the end because you can't get more than three to match. If you get three to match your turn end, you go directly to jail. Dub three plus equals one. By the way, I personally think, I think this actually gets a lot messier if you try checking if they're equal first. I think it actually ends up being a lot messier if you do it like that. But um, regardless, this is how it worked out. So um, let's see, what are those values? So those values actually, so we have these values, they shouldn't be in there because they're global values. They should be in here. Um, yep, yeah. so it was always gonna have to end like this. So we've got four values that I'm keeping track of. So I do it like this because it's. E I find that like for a lot of students who, uh, you know, when I throw things in lists and start keeping track of things in lists or dictionary, it becomes a lot scarier. So instead, what we're going to do is we've got these values, right? And what we're going to do is that I'm going to return, to get this out of the function, I'm going to return Let's see. Okay, yeah, no, I, I'm sorry. I'm overthinking this. Sorry, no. We're disregard that. I was being silly. So I was I was conflating two things. That works if I'm doing it in a while loop, but over here we've got an issue. Right? Got an issue is that these are global variables and I'm trying to access global variables. So instead of accessing global variables, what I'm gonna do instead is I'm just going to return the number of doubles. Return zero. Return one for one double. Return two for two doubles. And return three for three doubles. Normally I do it the other way. The 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 way the checking if d1 is equal to d2, and that makes things a bit different. So okay. So we've got our turn there. We've got these counters, which I'm going to get rid of in a bit, but that's part of the making process. This is also why this one's worth 20 points. Now on the exam, I'll give you a lot more pointers and directions on how to do this one. So, but over here, this itself, this is eight of those points over here. This next part, which I do over here, which is four, according to the rubric, four, or in range trials, boom, like that, for range in trials. For range in trials, what do we do? Well, we just need to simulate a th uh, that turn. Okay, this turn is going to, re is going to return some kind of result. It's going to return a number, the number of doubles we have. We don't need trials plus one. Trials is kind of the number that we have that, that's set at the beginning to say how many times we were going to run this program. Okay. So what we do is we say result is equal to turn. And we are going to say, okay, if result equal equals zero, dubs plus equals, sorry, dub zero plus equals one. And then you could just simply copy paste this. Right, if it's one, right, 
and this could be elif as well but honestly this is a not a great way to do this because there's so much more uh, writing to do instead the proper way to do this would be to um would be to do it like this let's go ahead and call this num dubs and we're going to store it into a list results but either way works i just like it this way Index zero holds the number of time we run, we got zero doubles. Index one holds the number of times we got one double. Index two holds the number of times we got two. Index three get, it has the number of times we got three doubles. And we just do this. Results of num dubs plus equals one. This, being able to do this comes from a lot, a lot, a lot of years of programming. Okay, as opposed to just simply knowing to do that off the bat. I expect you to do this. I'm extremely happy if you do this. Okay, both work. Trials is exclusive in range. Trials is gonna be 100,000. It's always gonna be 100,000. So it's fine. We don't, we don't need this, we don't need a variable here. We don't need that to vary. It's always, just do something, get the result, and increment appropriately. And so what we can do is we can now print our percentages, print for presenting the data in percentages, for, for in results. Hold on a second. So for arm results, results divided by um, trial, sorry, for R, R is divided by trials. So, sorry, going back to that, for R in results, so we go through each of the results, we take each of those individual results, how many doubles we got, and divide it by the number of trials. That's gonna give us our percentage. Run this. And we see this. This is perfectly fine. And what it shows is that 83% of the time we don't get a double. Okay. And that kind of makes sense because if you have two six-sided dice, right, only six of the combinations are matches. Getting two ones, two twos, two threes, two fours, two fives, and two sixes. That's six out of 36. Six divided by 36 is about 16% of the time. 1 minus 0.16666 is, as we can see, around 83%. And then getting one double accounts for 14% of the results. Getting two in a roll accounts for getting 2%. And then going directly to jail is half a percent, about. But that you have to do some kind of like, you know, mental math. So whenever... Sometimes you actually want to present them as percentages. This is perfectly fine. To present them as percentages, all we have to do is multiply by 100. And then we just simply add the percent symbol. Take this, convert it to a string after multiplying it by 100, add the percentage symbol, and those are, and suddenly we've got percentages here. 83% of the time. 14%, 2%, and about half a percent. Okay. Now. Okay. Two more questions to go. Given a string, write a function that returns the most common letter in a string. Use a dictionary to do this. Okay. Nice. Yeah, watch your head. Okay. Okay, most, so returns the most common letter in the string. So def, most common, and we're gonna say it takes in some text, okay? Get the most common letter in the, in the string. For this one, this is the way the dictionary questions are always gonna work on the exam for this one, which is given something to count, um, Find the most common thing in it. So again, 
I go over this in our lecture videos, but the way we do this one is we create a count dictionary. And what we do is we go for every single letter in the for every single letter in our text. We count it. Just character by character. And we ask ourselves, hey, if letter in count. If it's there, great. We'll we'll come back to that. Otherwise, if it's not in count, we fix that. We say count for that letter is equal to one. So the other one is if letter in count, if we is there, we say count is letter is equal to well, plus equals one. So if it's not there, it's one. If it is there, increment it by one. That's it to count. To, this actually gets you the majority of the points here. This is all the, always the way it works. For the thing in the thing I'm trying to count, if the letter is in count, sorry, if the thing I'm trying to count is already counted, you found it an initial time. Otherwise, it's the first time I found it. So write that down. Now, to how do I find the most common thing? Okay, uh, most common letter is equal to. Um, you don't have to use very long variable names like that on an exam. I, I I have the I have the ability to copy paste. So um, most common letter is going to be empty string, and most seen. Sorry, and let's go with highest count or max count is equal to zero. And what we do now is we say for letter in count. So when we iterate over a dictionary, it iterates over the string in the dictionary. So it iterates over the keys in the dictionary. So. I don't know why I said string. Okay, four letter in count. We say, we we get the, we would say if count of that letter is greater than the max count, if we've seen this letter more than the most, the thing we've seen the most, congrats, we found it. Most common letter, we found a new most common letter is equal to the letter and the max max count is equal to the count for that letter. And that's it. So um, if I run this, I know I didn't do anything, but the nice thing about idle is I can do this. I can say most common uh, in the let in most common should be M or N. Ooh, what did I do? Most common, I got N. So if count letter is greater than that, what did I do wrong? Most common in N. So if the letter is in text, interesting. Let's go ahead, let's take this over here, drop this in. Print this. What did I miss? And okay. Four letter in count. Print letter. Count. I count. Sorry, I've got a debug now. What did I mess up? Oh, sorry, somebody put it in chat. Oh yeah, yeah, that that, that matters a huge bit. Okay, so M N M O S T C. And so, okay, so I'm detecting, so I'm detecting M and O correctly. So why am I doing that? If 
four letter in oh because I'm returning the wrong thing. Doi. Return I was returning letter, which was the thing we used in the for loop and the last thing we used in the for loop. See. That was not a that was an unforced error on my part. That was a real error. Oh well, it happens. Don't worry about it. Too much. Okay. Now for this one. We're gonna then I'll leave leave you. Um so the outcome of any fair toying toss has an, so I went over this one last class or the beginning of this. The outcome of any four fair coin toss is landing on heads or tails. If I toss a coin three times, these are the eight possible sequences that come up can come up. And I challenge you to a game for hundred dollars. And I say, okay, if uh, you're going to choose a sequence, and then I'm going to choose one of these sequences. So you choose one of these eight eight sequences, and then I. You choose one of these eight sequences, and then I will choose one of these eight sequences. You can go first. How gratuitous of me, or gracious of me. It's, it's gracious, not gratuitous. All right. So, uh, and then what we do is we keep flipping a single coin until one of the one of those three, until one of the chosen sequences come up. So suppose you choose head, head, tail, and I choose Ted, hail, uh, Ted, ale, head, head. In this case, I win. Head, head, tail, you win. Tail, head, tail, tail, head, tail, head, head, I win. Because this is, the, because there, see the sequence, there's your sequence, there's my sequence, there's my sequence. So your sequence, your sequence, my sequence, my sequence. So we check the last three letters, the last three, until one of our ours won. It seems like a fair bet, after all, all of eight of those sequences are equally sorry, are equally likely to appear, but Professor Rosen, despite being dressed as Dumbledore, was sorted into Slytherin House, and so he's a bit of a trickster. Okay, so, um, so definitely, so this is something called Penny's game. So let's simulate this. Okay, Def Penny's. So here's a game function and then we're going to do the whole trials thing okay and i'm going to go pretty quick here okay um we're going to let and i'm going to the goal here is for you to choose one sequence and then another person's going to choose another sequence it says those are hard coded it doesn't matter sequence one sequence two either way works simulate it and print the number of times those sequences win okay so we've got sequence one and sequence two uh, we'll return one if one if if sequence one wins and two if sequence two wins. Okay, so what we do is we also just need a flip function def flip. Oh, we already wrote a flip function, I believe. Nope, never actually made it into this. It was in the uh, on the. I was I was talking about it. So flip, return, um, return random dot choice of header tails. Okay. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say this actual one is actually fairly straightforward. This is one of the one few times I'm going to do this and say this is the best solution. While true. What does that mean? It means go forever. Do this forever. That seems silly, but remember a return stops a program. So while true, we're going to say our sequence is equal to this. So while true, if we're going to do sequence plus equals a flip. If sequence sorry, if the last three characters of that sequence equals sequence one, return one to say a player with uh, the first sequence one. If sequence negative three to the end, sequence two, return two. And then there's no else. It just keeps going until one of those, 
until one of those things happen. Okay. And it was HHT THH. Random is not defined. Did I? Oh, I, I commented it out there. So let me. Okay. So player one wins, player two wins, player two wins, player one wins, player two wins, player two wins, player two wins, player two wins, player one wins, player one wins. So this is not telling us anything determinate. So we need to work on it. So again, we need to show, we need actual statistics. Trials is equal to uh, 100,000. So we're going to see how many times you win. We're going to count that. We're going to say wins is equal to zero. Um, for in trials. Um, we're going to do penny. If penny of what is it? It's yes, yeah, it's HHT comma T H H equal equals one, then player one wins. So wins plus equals one. Print. Wins divided by trials. Int is not iterable. Oh, that's a common mistake. That's a that's a that's a mistake you should make, and I'm not me. There we go. Twenty five percent chance of winning. So the odds are not in your favor. All right. If you want to know more about how this works. Uh, I have a YouTube link down here you can click on in this PDF, and I suggest, and I recommend you do so. It's a very interesting thing. But what it is is that basically, by because you go first, I can actually choose a a a sequence that subsumes your sequence. It makes it so that unless you win directly, then if I choose the sequence appropriate, I appropriately, I'll I'll be able to win very often. All right. So stop share. So stop sharing. Now to recap, exam is on, is in your lab. It will be I, either the 5th, the 6th, the 7th, the 8th, or the 11th, depending on when your lab is. DRS, please schedule appropriately. And if you have troubles with that, just send me an email. Likewise, um, you get one sheet of paper front and back. The exam takes the, uh, the session. I'll try to drop it on discord. Um, if not, I'll upload it to GitHub, but yes, I should be able to upload it right afterwards. All right. Um, but yeah, otherwise, good luck on the exam. If you have any issues, please let me know. If you get sick, please let me know. Um, have fun, stay, stay safe uh, during Halloween, all right? All right, otherwise, I'll see you all. Happy Halloween.